Welcome to Theater Corner. I'm your host, Michael Taylor. Today we're filming on the campus of University of Texas at Austin in the building of uh, the Moody College of Communications. Today our guest is the incredible Dr. Lisa B. Thompson. Welcome to Theater Corner. This has been a long time coming. <laughs> I'm so glad we finally were able to, to track you down and uh, get you to sit here at Theater Corner. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm so happy to have you here in my new city of Austin, <laughs> and I hope you're having a great time. We're on the campus because this is where you teach? Yes, I teach at UT Austin. I've been here since 2012, mm. and I teach in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies, which is a very long title for <laughs> black studies. We uh. think of it uh, encompassing not just the U.S., but the entire globe. So that's what makes our program distinctive. And for the, just a couple of people in the middle of Wisconsin that, that hasn't heard of you, could you tell us a little bit about your back. Where, where, where does Dr. Thompson come from? And... Oh, well, I'm a California girl. All right. I was born in San Francisco, mm. and I uh, studied in California. I did my undergraduate degree at UCLA, go Bruins, <laughs> and I also did my MA in African American Studies, African American Studies at UCLA. And I went on to go back up to the Bay Area to go to Stanford for my PhD in modern thought and literature. So I consider myself a California girl, born mm -hmm. and bred. Mm -hmm. And then my life took me to the East Coast. I did my, actually before I finished my doctorate, I did a dissertation fellowship at Smith College, wrote my dissertation there, and came back, did a postdoc at UC Davis. Mm -hmm. And after that, my first job was in upstate New York at the State University of New York at Albany, which was very cold. <laughs> and, and, and isolated. <laughs> and isolated. <laughs> but it also gave me um, two and a half hours. I was down, um, down in New York City, being able to go see off-Broadway and Broadway shows. So um, it was you know, a great place. I would live somewhere that was quiet and mm -hmm. get my work done and then I could jump it down on a train and play at the best playground in the U.S. So <laughs> it wasn't a bad start to my uh, professional life. All right, that's beautiful. You're almost a walking brain, almost. <laughs> I tell you, that's beautiful. That's, that's what black excellence looks like, you know. All right, I'll take it, I'll take it, thank you. <laughs> Very much so. So you mentioned going down to Off-Broadway. You, you've actually had a piece uh, produced yeah, there, yes. Off-Broadway. Single black female, uh, made its way from California, where it started in 1999, mm. and uh, it's the Rhinoceros in San Francisco, directed by Coleman Domingo. Oh, all right. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's his, my first play, his first play he directed, and it went on to Los Angeles, and while it was in Los Angeles, someone from um, a board from another a theater in New York saw it and wanted to bring it to New York, so um, New Professional Theater brought it to New York. It was off Broadway at the Duke on 42nd Street. Mm. Um, Cohen Domingo once again directed that production, and um, it's been running ever since. It opens um, later this month in Fort Worth, and then it's, it's going to be back in San Francisco at the Lorraine Hansberry Theater wow. in uh, October. So it's that pretty amazing. That one's got amazing. some legs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as my dad would say, some gams. <laughs> so yes, Single Black Female has been been running strong for a while, and it was published by Samuel French in 2012. So I'm really happy that Samuel French's publication allowed more people to have access to it, not only theaters, but also in the classrooms. People are teaching it as well. So it's been nice to have an audience, both readership and then as well folks who are um, mm. seeing it in the theater. So other publications, you just finished a book. Yes, actually, Northwestern University Press uh -huh. is going to publish um, three of my plays, a collection. It's called Underground and Other Plays, which includes Underground, the first play that I had produced, it had a world premiere in Austin at the Vortex Theater. Mm. Um, and Underground's about two black men who are old friends from college, who are, used to be renegades, undergrads, who pushed for um, dis dis uh, divestment from apartheid, uh, to, to put pressure on um, the U.S. government. And now they're in their 50s and trying to wonder, okay, well, What's our role now in pushing black mm. politics forward? One has gone on to become a lawyer and has a very comfortable life, upstate New York. <laughs> and the other one is a bit of a Al Sharpton character who's gone on and really made his profession to be um, black political uh, agitation. And mm. they are stuck together in one, a brownstone that belongs to one of them. And um, a snowstorm is brewing. And at the same time, that the FBI is on the lookout for a 
black medical uh, group leader, and it's not clear which one of them it is. <laughs> so that's that play. And the other two other plays are in, are included include um, the Monroe, which is a my f historical play, which is about the black migration from Louisiana uh. or, or the South to the West Coast to California. I was really fascinated by African Americans who decided no Detroit, no New York, no <laughs> D.C., no Chicago. We are going to California, wow. which is what my family did. So mm -hmm. I was always fascinated by what would made us. Make what my, my family decided to make that journey instead. So that was my me imagining that and what prompted um, the folks to move. And so Monroe was about um, the aftermath of a rent of a lynching, and why they decided to try to head out. So did you discover? Was there a recognizable something? Was was it pushing to California or was Cal something in California pulling them to California? That's a great question. Um, both. Okay. Um, one being this, uh, the fear, the terror, of racial terror going mm -hmm. on. And it's funny that when the production happened, I actually wrote it, the first draft of it when I was a graduate student at Stanford in Sheree Moraga's class. And um, just for me, I thought about what would make someone um, leave and thinking about lynching. I had not realized, my parents didn't really talk about lynching. Um, I remember mentioned it once over, you know, a Sunday uh, big breakfast of... Mm -hmm. Oh, yummy! Uh, my mom used to make wonderful breakfast, grits, and you know <laughs> everything, uh, eggs and bacon and all the sausages. Yeah. And I'm um, mentioning someone being lynched, and that was the only time I remember in my childhood. Uh -huh. And then when the play was about to be produced by the Austin Playhouse, I started doing more research, getting ready to do the revisions. And at the same time, the museum was being op was opening um, about the lynching um, memorial, and a lot of the things that came out of e the EJI were about the history of lynching in America, and I found out that the parish that my mother grew up in, which is where Monroe is, was a number five in all of the most lynchings in the United States. Jeez. So to think that she came from that, you know, and my, my really beloved uncle, Aubrey, who was a very gentle person, that they mm. came from the place that had so much terror really struck me. So I had not realized that when I first wrote it, though. Incredible. And I think it's like, in many ways, what we do as playwrights is do spirit work, and they're kind of open to stories and... Mm. what comes through you, and later on you realize, oh my goodness, this was really serious. So um, Monroe is the second play in that collection, um, and the third one is The Mambalogs, which is opening soon um, at the, well, soon, in less than two weeks at the Vortex. Let's talk about that, the, the Mambalogs. So you, this, is, <laughs> this is a play you have opening on August 23rd. Yes. Right here in Austin. Right here in Austin, a world premiere at the Vortex, which also did the for, uh, world premiere of Underground. And The Mambalogs is a story about middle class single mothers who are black mm -hmm. and um, trying to navigate how the world sees them, how the world sees their children, and also um, how they see each other and other women, um, both black women who are not working middle class, but also um, dealing with white women, and just the whole thing. And it's a comedy, <laughs> and it's satirical, and it really is um, a labor of love. Okay. Um, trying to tell stories about the kind of women that I know very well, but don't see anywhere uh, in uh. film or TV. Or, so it'd be nice to, to see that because they are, they're not 20 years old, mm. um, and they are not married, and they are um, moms. So mm. it's been interesting to talk about that. What I'm hearing almost, some of the material and ideas for your plays are, I mean, things that you're just rushing up on and noticing and observing yeah. day to day. Yes. Of. I think that's, that's, that's actually very uh, astute. I mean, it's not only what I observe, but also my own internal experience as a black woman navigating the world and feeling like not uh, like I don't fit in. Mm. So the narrative about blackness is often um, about the East Coast and the South, it's a, kind of the authentic sites of blackness and then being a ca black Californian, like where mm. do we fit in? So that's kind of drew that, drew that and you know, something I'm thinking about actually writing about the next chapter it was now become my Black Migration Trilogy, beginning with Monroe, <laughs> and then next is a play called Gold, which I'm working on, which is about the family in 1972 mm. in San Francisco, and you got the Panthers, you have folks coming back home from Vietnam, uh. and you're also dealing with kind of the economic um, challenges and this, what you were saying earlier, but this, this drawing of people to California that idea of you know go, the gold rush uh, in many ways that yeah. you know, racial peace and harmony and equality and then finding out what's really there <laughs> um, so 
Um, so I'm fascinated by, by that. But also, um, you're, you're right, too, that people I know and the things that I see and notice and want to see um, kind of the questions I have about the world as a black woman kind of unpacked in that way. And think that I also come across as I'm you know, doing my research uh, for my scholarly work. So you, you find yourself, as you're going through life, you, you're, you're taking notes, I mean, <laughs> seeing things in the context of, well, that would look on stage or something like that. Or Yeah, yeah, yeah I think, or I have some character come to me, um, sometimes it's really somebody that will come to me in, me, in my mind and think, uh, what's their story? Mm. So uh, that is completely fabricated. Never, I, I've, never, I've never met anyone that I was like, okay, I want to write a story about this particular person. Okay. But it's really um, the story's there, and then the, the, a character kind of appears that's kind of speaking f- for that. So the, the, for the story about um, San Francisco in 1972, that's, gonna be, that's Goldie, this, this figure I came up with, this kind of a cousin who's um, a uh, Vietnam vet who shows up um, from Vietnam to mm. the to the city and doesn't want to does not want to go back to the south and wants to spend, uh. be in San Francisco with the rest of the family that migrated to, you know before when he was a child and um, just thinking about how we are many things that I definitely I remember w- walking across UCLA's campus back in the, some years ago with a friend of mine and it was a sunny day and it started raining mm. I looked at him I said Dwight the devil's beating his wife. And he said, he's from, he's from uh, South Carolina. And so he said, what you know about that from California? And I'm like, well, you know, so it's all there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people, all of us people joke around that the Bay Area is, you know, Louisiana West. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really want to think about um, the, the push-pull of the South and the, uh, the other different locations for black people and how we kind of um, contain all, multitudes, even if we are um, from one region, we carry the marks of others in mm. regions. I want you to talk about your influences, you know, because mm. uh, there, there, you do teach this, um, this broad umbrella under uh, yeah. uh, uh, Toni Morrison and, and August Wilson. Are, are those particular influences I, of yours? D- wow, well, I, I definitely think that um, Toni Morrison and August Wilson inspire me and, and, and been influences in my work. Um, okay. I love teaching a course on the t- two of them because they, Right now, particularly was where I am in my life, I look to them because they both started their careers late, mm. 39 years old, right? Morrison's mm. first public, um, publication happens. Um, I think, I believe Wilson's first um, play is produced at the same time. And I think what, what you can do starting at that time, because this country is so fascinating with the top people under 30. Uh, and it's like, yeah. I, I wanna, I'm planning on writing something about artists to watch over 40. <laughs> and uh, because the, think about Morrison at 39, and she passes at, um, she just recently passed, right? You know, at 88. That means you know, a lot of us have a lot of decades to still create work right, right. and make a mark on the world. So, um, but also the language they used and their love of black people and their their sense of blackness being so unapologetic and bold and um, was so important to me to have those voices to be able to read their work, to see their work, and to um, see the kind of black people I knew and loved and know and love on stage and in their books. Um, complicated people, mm. right? Um, this idea that they were both reluctant to present black people as perfect in, mm-hmm. in, in, in order to gain some sense of um, being treated with humanity by a country that does not do that. Um, that they right. were more interested in the humanity we have for each other. So um, also other influences I would look to Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez, I mean, reading their work, and Alice Walker, they were all really foundational for me as an artist. Um, but also, E.E. E. Cummings. Mm-hmm. I love um, his work. I love all the time. I remember going to the San Francisco Public Library, showing up at the desk with my 14 books, which was a maximum, and the librarian would say, well, those are due in two weeks. I'm looking at her <laughs> going, I'll be done in eight days. <laughs> um, don't push me, lady. So... Um, Reading uh, uh, quite a bit, and also I think really hearing on KDIA radio, um, the Oakland was a Oakland's radio station, and I heard um, the advertising for for Color Girls, mm. and they had a you know, source of performing. You know, I loved you assiduously for eight months, two weeks, and a day. <laughs> and I was like, I gotta see this. My mom said, No, you're not. Um, I was in eighth grade, I believe, um, but. That was really inspiring. So I got inspiring. I, I, I got the uh, a copy of the collect of the play, and that really 
was probably the most foundational until I ended up in her classroom as an undergraduate at UCLA, and um, she invited this up-and-coming playwright named George Wolfe to mm. class, a friend of hers, and <laughs> um, went to see Color Museum, and those two, I think, really are, for me as a playwright, it's Shange and George Wolfe, who really influenced my work. Um, later become, comes um, August Wilson. Okay. Um, but really, um, and I love Learning Hansberry as well, but those two really are my, kind of my spirit uh, people. <laughs> and I luckily got to see both of them uh, a couple years ago at a celebration of, um, a, 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 there was a reading of Color Museum be, doing, happening in New York, and I got a chance to spend time with him and with her again before she passed. So. One thing about you, I think, is just absolutely amazing. Because you you write uh, uh, theater reviews, yes. academic theater reviews, and 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 the, the importance of that coming from the perspective of of a black female. Yeah. Uh, tell us about this. How, how did this come about, and and exactly, you know, where is that published? Yeah. Oh my goodness! So it's really important to me um, right now. It's an odd thing. I, I call myself a scholar artist, or artist scholar, depending on what room I'm in, mm. um, because I both create plays, but also I also write criticism about um, plays. And I really, my um, work as a cultural critic is to make sure this moment is happening right now for black theater makers is recognized in academia. Mm. So I've done um, several reviews for Theater Journal, which is a prominent uh, academic journal. So I wanted to be able to solidify these Production. So I did one for Pipeline, Dominic Morrisot's Pipeline at Lincoln um, Theater Center, and it was really important for me to kind of make sure that folks understand her significance. I think that MacArthur has done that as well, mm -hmm. but I do want to see more of her uh, work being discussed in academia. I teach her almost, I definitely teach her every year. Um, Coleman Domingo is someone I also um, write about, and I did a review of Lights Out Nice King Cole, which he did with Patricia McGregor Yay. at the Geffen, <laughs> and starting off at uh, People's, People's Light, but I did the, I wrote about the production of the Geffen, which was uh. a amazing uh, show that ended up um, breaking box office, box office records, but also really, I think, remaking the jukebox musical or the, you know, this, 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 this idea. So that's important to me. I'm also working on a new um, scholarly book looking at black theater makers right now who are looking back at black history and how they're reimagining black history. So I write about Katori Hall. Mm. I write about um, the work of Betty and Jacob Jenkins and others and try to think about what's going on in this moment that's making them look back at eras that they did not live through but really find important for us to kind of think about. I also write about more so mm. in that one book. It's called Making History. Um, <laughs> making History Black. <laughs> so, um, looking forward to finishing that in the list in the year or so. But I'm actually um, looking forward to having some time away from <laughs> everything <laughs> at some point. But I don't see it in the horizon. But, <laughs> but um, that's the next scholarly book project. So I, I think I think of my writing as being they influence each other. So I write some scholarship and I also write um, creatively, and they often speak together. So Single Black Female was the play that was what came out of the research I was doing as a graduate student. And that scholarly book was Beyond the Black Lady, Sexuality, and the New African American Middle Class. Mm -hmm. So those two are kind of sister projects. And with Underground and Monroe, these kind of plays that are set, deal with black history are you know, sister projects to Making History scholar, um, scholarly book that's coming out next. So what about uh, for film? <laughs> can we can we expect uh, <laughs> sc screenplays from uh, Dr. Mm. Thompson anytime soon? I think there, there's definitely an exciting time right now for Black creatives, um, and I do imagine some of my plays would be make good um, series mm. for, <laughs> or um, a, a um, standalone film. I'm also interested in in, in starting to do write, you know, definitely short. Do, do some shorts and see how that goes. Um, I'm open to um, getting in a writer's room and working for a TV show. Who oh, knows? Um, right. I'm, I'm open to all of those things. It's the next level stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah, see, I mean, once you've um, really kind of broadened your, your horizon, well, let's put it this way. It's important to broaden your horizons and to keep challenging yourself and see what else you can do 
Um, and I think that right now is an extraordinary time for black creatives um, in performance and theater and film. You have another piece coming up. <laughs> yes. Coming up here in the beginning of next year. Yes, in February, the my new play, Dinner, is opening at the Ground Floor Theater. Maybe here. we should mention it's February of 2020. Yes. <laughs> February <laughs> this 2020. This film lasts forever. <laughs> yes. So six months from now, or more or less, um, it's a family comedy that looks at the tensions between African Americans and Africans oh my. in the U.S. <laughs> and if I do a good job, everybody's going to be mad at me. <laughs> so um, it's fun. It's a reimagining of the very famous movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Oh. With um, upper middle class African Americans and wealthy Nigerians. Oh my. <laughs> so um, I use some of the same names. Um, but the rest of it is, is my story. So it's, um, and it's also set in San Francisco. Uh, the Bay, well, actually in Oakland. So in the Bay Area, just like the original film was set in San Francisco. So, so I've been here in Austin for, for a couple of days. I can't help but to notice that there's few people that look like me here. Mm. You're, you're teaching at this prominent school here in, in Texas. Your teaching is, is heavily, you know, couched in, 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 in yeah. blackness. Yes. In a city that many feel is it's steeped in anti-blackness. Uh, and so um, navigating that is sometimes challenging. There's a really long and wonderful tradition of African-American resistance in Austin. Mm. Um, right now, the numbers are dwindling for black Austinites, and it's been something that people are sounding the alarm about. Um, one of my colleagues has done a lot of research about this, um, how gentrification is really making the black community dissipate in Austin. And a striking statistic is that Austin is one of the few fast-growing cities in the country that's losing its black population at the same time that it's gaining others. Mm. So um, for the university, um, the numbers are quite good because it is the place where it has holding the line in terms of affirmative action, that whole Supreme Court case. Um, that they have um, really battled to uh, maintain mm -hmm. their affirmative action policies. So we have a um, significant group of students that are hungry for black studies. And um, luckily, we have a very large faculty and a very impressive faculty that teaching those courses. And I love being able to teach my students and to um, be a resource for them outside of the classroom as well. But it is um, a, a challenging time in the whole country, and in particular um, in Texas um, and in, in Austin, um, trying to keep students thinking about what's possible instead of um, feeling dark and challenged by what is right now. Wow, you're this superwoman of <laughs> because you're you're doing all of this stuff, and and you and you're you're a single mother. Yes. What is what is that like? That on taking like, especially now because you're doing a, a tremendous amount of work. Yes, it's. Um, I don't think about it um, so much because if I did, I probably would just mm. um, grab my son and fly somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's homeschooling him on some island. Um, but it is, luckily, I also have a tremendous amount of, of energy. Uh. Of, uh, I'm containing it right now so I can give a <laughs> good interview. But I really do uh, wake up. Uh, people say, you want some coffee? I'm like, I don't need coffee. Mm. I'm like, I'm ready. Let's, <laughs> you know, let's go. So I feel a sense of urgency about um, my creative work, about my scholarship, about my teaching, but I also think about them as all one thing. Okay. And, and I tell my students often, I'm like, uh, I'm trying to make sure you're tight and have it together so you can change the world my son's going to be entering into. Uh, so hey. <laughs> uh, it's all connected together yeah. um, for me. But yeah, it is um, really uh, wonderful, though, to, f to love what you do mm -hmm. and to be supported to do the things that you love, whether it's the city itself, the theater, uh, the theaters p producing my work, or the students taking my classes, mm -hmm. um, and um, just feeling that you can make a difference and share the things that you're excited about uh, and help people think critically about so many important issues around you know, black life, um, black joy, black creativity, and black... Um, like you said, black excellence, <laughs> um, and I expect a lot from my students. Yeah. I expect a lot from my from my son. Yeah. I also expect a lot from myself. 
Okay. So that's consistent too. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. So again, you, you, you got the mama logs. Yes. Here, uh, August 23rd until September 7th, 2019, right here in, in <laughs> at the at the Vortex Repertory Theater. Yes. In, in Austin, so that's that's exciting. Maybe maybe I can make my way back over here. I would love that. Catch that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you again for taking out uh, time in your busy schedule to sit down with a brother. Dr. Lisa B. Thompson in the house. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. by. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, viewers, for tuning in to another episode of Theater Corner, and we'll see you next time.